Hi everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here to uh, speak to you again. And this is a presentation about versioning. And well, my name indeed is Konstantin, um, almost like in the movie. Uh, and well, I did talk about uh, a few APIs, um, mostly in Russian, but I did talk about the 2014 one here. Uh, and it was a talk about doing partner APIs and about what are the constraints and maybe ideas. And well, today I'm talking about an internal API at Badoo. So basically, the idea is that I'll be, um, well, I'll be talking about what kind of API we have, uh, about, well, versioning as it is usually done, about versioning as, as, it done, as it is done by us, which is much greater, and, well, some practical considerations. Um, well, Badoo, uh, you may or may not have heard about us, depending on which country you're from. Actually, it is the largest data network um, on Earth. Uh, and, uh, well, it has an API. Not only does it have an API, it had an API since 2010, and it's never had a huge break in change. It's an evolving thing. And it's not RESTful. Uh, it's actually RPC style and protobuf based for our mobile clients, JSON based for web clients. And currently we have uh, almost 600 different commands there, uh, over a thousand or more classes. And we do a release um, every uh, well, every working day in the morning and in the evening, except uh, on Friday evening, we don't do release because we drink instead. So, and yeah, we have uh, five clients to this API. This is an internal thing, uh, but not really five clients. Uh, it's not just iOS, Android, uh, Windows Phone, and web and mobile web. Also, it has last versions for those clients. So it's like five last versions for iOS and also the old, old, old version that still works in iOS 7, 10 last versions for Android and still something works in 2.x. And well, just a couple, whoa, a couple of versions for um, Windows Phone. Well, because Windows Phone. But we do have working Windows Phone 7 version, which is nice. Um, so this is a talk about versioning, right? And well, I think as an API designer, you probably have heard quite a few things about versioning. Maybe read a few art articles even. So how does it typically go? We have an API. Let's say it looks like this. And at this API, uh, well, some problems start to accumulate. We start realizing that it's not ideal, and we cannot make it ideal in a non-breaking way. <laughs> Hell yeah. In a non-breaking way. So we start collecting changes that we want to work with and, well, that are nice to have. Well, we can't really do that, right, because we will break compatibility. But at some point of time, we decide, okay, it's, it's done. We actually have to change the API. Maybe business logic has changed. Maybe we're just too tired with all those problems and non-idealness of our API. So, well, we announce a version 2, and after that, we slowly deprecate version 1. And well, a lot of articles about versioning actually talk about this thing. And they say, well, you, don't have, you, you shouldn't do that. Because, well, it's, it's not, not restful enough when you do a V2 out there in the URL. So maybe instead you can have a V2 at the end to, to version each resource, which is, of course, even worse. Oh, well, you, you can do a header, a header, sorry, or like XAPI version, or you can use accept header. Uh, which will probably make Roy Fielding more happy. But this, uh, all the articles, all the presentations even about versioning are about this. And, well, it's just a, a, a small part. It's the least important step, in my opinion. What I'd like to really look at is this whole process. Because if we think about it, um, especially when doing an internal API, we may see that there actually is no version 2. And, well, I'd like to introduce something, well, more amazing that we're doing. It's called continuous versioning. Let me start with a few examples, like simple things first. Okay, so new property supersedes old. Okay, that's, uh, let's, let's take an example. Uh, we have this feature in Badoo called verification. We get, uh, well, a user, when he or she adds um, social network gets a nice check mark, which is cool. 
But um, later on, uh, well, this is the this is the check mark. But later on, our designers tell us, okay, we have to do some more rigorous checks, and we'll have a photo verification feature. And while well, the users who also have photo verified now get a nice badge. So um, this is actually a little problem for us, because we had a binary logic that said, OK, is verified it either true or false. And now it has more like three statuses, right? Now, like not verified, partially verified, and fully verified. And we have to somehow uh, still support the old versions that do not know about the, um, the, this verification thing, and the new versions that do know. So well, it's quite easy, right? We just have both fields. Uh, and well, old clients will use the old field, the new client will use the new fields. Problem solved. Well, except, of course, we have traffic problems and we have documentation problems where we have to document, okay, this is the old thing, do not use it, this is the new thing. Yeah. Um, well, we can do better, and this is actually a more or less solved problem. You know GraphQL, uh, or you, we can do anything similar to GraphQL, which is what we do, uh, where we have a list of fields requested by clients, and while well, if clients request verification status, this is what they get. If the client request is verified, this is what they get. So, well, this is nothing new, right? This, probably most of you know this. So, okay, if you have a property um, that changed its logic, okay, you just add a new field, and so the clients will just negotiate the fields. But this is, and well, GraphQL, uh, when GraphQL says it solves versioning, it's speaking about this, but this is not the, um, the hardest change that you'll encounter. Like, suppose you have the thing, like similar structures of different type. What do I mean by that? Well, Badoo has a lot of banners, and all those banners actually sell something from our own site. So here it is. Um, and in this banner, uh, well, and we have 34 types of those. Well, and it's nice and dandy. They all probably look the same. We have a header, we have three pictures, we have text, and we have a button. So we just put there into an API. But then designer comes to us and say, oh, we have this thing called banner blindness, and we don't want that. So actually, you know, each banner will be its own special snowflake. So the blue banner will have Mickey Mouse-like layouts, the orange will have uh, uh, rectangular photos, the pink will have those weird hearts, uh, the gray one will have one picture, the green one will not have a header. And at this point of time, we just can't really express it in API terms, so we just introduce something called type, um, which is nice. But when we have banner types, and when we're const constantly adding banners, um, we have that problem. When the client asks for banners, we have a risk that a uh, server will send an unknown banner, because something that, that was introduced after the client was done. And we can, of course, version it in the same fashion, having this v1, v2, v3, which, but this is not flexible enough, and also it's ugly, so I don't like that. But, well, it's kind of obvious what we do now. We introduce a list of supported banners, so each and every time a client requests banners, it may send a list of supported banners, or alternatively, you can just do it at the start of the uh, of, of your application, because, well, we don't have a RESTful API, so we do not have a stateless API. We have a, a startup call at the beginning, and we send it there. So uh, besides having uh, versioning the banners and being able to decide, uh, to easily decide which banners to show to clients, we also get some client specifics for free. Like, for example, this banner, it's a swipeable thing, and it's not viable on desktop because most desktops do not have, um, well, touch screen, right? So this banner is simply mobile only, and uh, this, is, this logic does not, uh, is not on uh, the back end. The website just do not, does not report it. So, well, similar structures of different types, you can solve that by sending, uh, well, one, by sending the list of types that the client supports to the server. Um, but this is not the complex thing. We have maybe even something more horrible, uh, like business logic changes. So this is, this is uh, my profile on Badoo. Uh, well, these are all my photos. 
Uh, and, well, it works exactly as you'd imagine it to. The client requests photos and, well, the server replies with photos. But then designers come to me and say, okay, we want to add videos, but they will be exactly the same as the photos, and they can be mixed in with the photos. They will have the same properties as the photos, except they'll have a play button. But we do not want old clients to show videos as if they were photos. We just want old clients to avoid showing videos. So, and at this point, we understand that we can reuse the approach that we used when we introduced banner types, but to abstract changes. So we have a, a, a supported changes array. And we say, OK, this client knows that you may send videos among with photos. And only in this case does the server send video along with photos. And this is actually a quite powerful thing that allows you to avoid we too. Uh, and, well, it helps you in many, many cases. Like, for example, when you have a business logic change. So we used to have this process of buying that where you, you first have a screen and then you enter the credit card's detail. And then we decided we sometimes don't want to show you this preliminary screen. And so instead of, um, like this. So instead of, uh, well, having, uh, adding a new command or rewriting something, we just added a flag and now uh, the client that knows that it can get billing screen gets it. And the most fun thing that you can do with change flags is API refactoring. And this is something that I always wish to do as an API designer. And at Badoo I finally can really do that, like generalizing. When we had this banner with one button, and uh, then we had banner with several buttons, no problem. We, um, we change all the button uh, objects into buttons array and cover it with a flag. Uh, we can change global logic, like for example, how errors work uh, along the whole API. So instead of untyped errors, we now get uh, typed errors. Uh, which you can cover any screw-ups, like when we had some dates in UTC, some dates not in UTC, we had a change flag, okay, now all dates are in UTC. And well, this helps uh, the longevity of API really well. So when you have business logic changes, you can do the changes behind version flag. But I can develop this uh, thing even further. Like for example, when you have to do a simultaneous release on several clients, uh, like video calling. You do not want video calling to be released only on Windows Phone. Who will the users call to, right? So, and when you see this release plan, you think, oh God, I have to somehow manage the, the iOS review process, and then I have to maybe submit all the code to, to, to other stores, and how do I coordinate this? And well, you just have the same list of uh, changes or features, as they will be called here, um, and the server will reply which features are to be enabled in API. And so if the server, uh, in, this, is, in this example, the, service, uh, the client says, okay, I, I can support video calls and sending GIFs. And the server says, well, you just do support sending GIFs, but hide the video call. So this works as well. So, and this also, uh, besides simultaneous release, it allows for A-B testing, of course, it allows for uh, disabling some features for, spam f uh, for spammy users or disabling some features for uh, unpaid users, which is nice. So, feature negotiation. But even that is not enough. We want to do some quick experiments. Like, for example, we had this um, uh, feature that we were not sure about at all, which is called What's My Chances, which shows what's the chance of um, reply of that girl, which is a paid feature. And we were not sure maybe they will write to girls less and will lose activity and will not pay for that. So we run that on Windows Phone, which is a nice concept in itself. Windows Phone is an experimental pro platform because we don't really care about this 3% of users, right? And, and you, 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 I'll give the link to the article later. It's really fun. So we have the experimental protocol. And it's built in such a way that uh, when we have our API definitions and when we build them for clients to use, like classes, um, we do not build experimental protocol in for um, major platforms like Android. 
But we do, uh, uh, so the Android does not even know it's there, has no way of um, accessing it. And Windows Phone does have the way of accessing it, and only Windows Phone. So they have, uh, they run these experiments really fast. As I've told you, we uh, are dropping the uh, win old Windows Phone versions really fast, so we can go and do an experiment. It's done ad hoc, or basically just a back-end developer and a Windows Phone developer in the room say, okay, the API will be like this, it's very hacky, we launch, we measure, we, then we either redo the, the feature or destroy it. So you can have a super set experimental API and use it only on one platform, preferably something that's not too risky. So remember this typical versioning thing I've shown you in the end. I think that what I've shown you is much better. You can, have, uh, uh, you can do continuous versioning without ever introducing a huge breaking change. You'll do, you can add new fields for new features, have a list of supported things that the client sends to the server. Um, cover changes with change flags, which are again client sends to the server. And let server control enabling and disabling of the features and create API supersets for experimenting. So you might ask how does it work on practice? Well, better than on this picture. It actually works pretty good. Uh, we have um, 200 feature flags now and 161 negotiable feature now. And with this API that was created in 2010 and never had a major breaking change, we, were actually, um, we actually managed to move our desktop web client to API 98% um, for now, very quickly and efficiently with only a few changes and flags. So basically, the architects are happy. Uh, we can do refactoring all the times. The client developers are happy. They can only change the thing that they're focused on. And this is also the happiness of product owners who get exactly what they want. So if this change is not required from a business perspective, well, we just don't do it on the client. Well, backend developers are not too happy, of course, because they have to support all these things. But, well, we have a few things for them. For example, we have the upgrade suggestion screen. As I've told you, we only support a few, uh, a few versions back. So first we show you the screen with a skip button that you won't be able to even see here. But if you do not upgrade for long enough, we hide the skip button altogether. So you will have, an, uh, you will have to upgrade or you will not be able to use the old client. And also we have a dashboard that shows which features are supported by which versions. And when the server developer sees that the buttons array is supported by all the versions, it says, okay, cool, uh, we, can, we can actually remove this code. So in practice, backend developers can still work sanely, and also these flags allow them to parallel their work better. So uh, I think that this versioning scheme can actually uh, be used in public APIs as well, and I'm eager for some of you to try um, I do it myself, but I work in Medusa or whatever. Uh, and, well, this concludes my presentation. And this presentation has a companion site, uh, which has all the links to the presentation, to the articles that I mentioned, to some other articles about our API, to my previous talk, whatever. So, knowwe2.coja.ru. Thank you.